Welcome to today's free LSAT Demon class. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Nathan Fox, and uh, this is going to be a version of the class that I teach every. Uh, sorry, the camera is slowly lowering as I talk. Uh, <laughs> this is a version of the class that I teach every Tuesday and Thursday night at lsatdemon.com, and I'm super happy that you guys are here. We're going to start with some um, open Q&A, and so you guys are free to uh, unmute yourselves and participate. That would be great. You can also put questions into the chat. Uh, I should have a TA here at some point who will help me to manage that chat, but uh, if not, I think I can handle it. I've been doing this for a while, so should be able to figure it out. Um, what have you guys been working on? What can I help with? Somebody talk to me. Uh, logic games or like just like uh, graphing them, you know what I mean? Setting them up. Sure. Trying to get yeah. good at it. Sure. It's largely a matter of practice. We're going to start uh, today with a uh, one logic game. Um, there are 370 something, I guess, logic games um, <clears throat> to look at. And, uh, you know, every class that I teach, we do one of those. Um, the Demon has multiple videos for every single logic game that has ever existed. Uh, one of the best ways you can improve it. Taisha is asking about grouping games, but one of the best ways that you can improve at uh, grouping games or any type of logic game is simply to just practice all of them and then consider different approaches. Um, sometimes when I teach, I actually will like set it up one way and then say, okay, but what if we decided to approach it in an entirely different way? And then I'll just set it up in a totally, uh, some other totally different way. Um, you will see me that in, see me do that uh, in my classes from time to time. The games are highly improvisational and they are very susceptible to brute force, um, at least in terms of just practicing them a lot. I think that, and I've written about this a lot. Um, I think that the LSAT is largely a test of how hard you can work and on the logic games, it, that's just abundantly clear that if you put in the time, you put in the practice, you demonstrate to the law schools that you are a good worker bee and you're willing to do the kind of prep that's required for, by the way, required for law school and required certainly for legal practice. Um, the, the logic games are kind of like a uh, toy version of that kind of work that you'll have to do. And so if you just like do all of them, I mean, I promise you that people are like, I just can't wrap my mind around grouping games. And I'm like, okay, well, how many sections of games have you done? And they're like, three. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, that's a good start, but we got 90 sections worth of games that you can work on. And, um, you know, probably it's just a matter of putting in the, the reps and, uh, then for sure, you know, like if you get stuck and you're just totally frustrated banging your head against the wall, then I would definitely recommend to watch some videos. Um, the way I would say, the way I would recommend, by the way, that you should use those videos uh, is to watch a bit of it until you feel like you've kind of got an idea about the game and then hit pause and then work on it on your own as long as you want and then unpause it and then, um, you know, if you, if you get stuck again, that, that's kind of positive. Okay, let's see. Uh, Brett asked, other than reviewing formal logic, do I have any tips for sufficient assumption questions? Um, Brett, are you able to talk to me? Where is Brett? Yeah, I can. Cool, hi, Brett. Oh, Brett's got the Homer Simpson. Um, hey, Brett, so, what is your plan on a sufficient assumption question? Yeah, so for sufficient assumption, um, I guess normally I'm afraid of losing out on time. I guess so I don't really diagram um, unless I can tell that they're very difficult questions. Um, 
And I think like that discrepancy of trying to just like find the gap, um, you know, in the argument to make it a valid argument. Um, I guess I just sort of falter on. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. Okay. I had an idea that that might be the case. What? What? How would you know? It, how, how do you know that the correct answer is correct on a sufficient assumption question? Because uh, it will guarantee uh, the conclusion, right? Good. Um, and the one thing that you didn't say, Brett, that I, I was really trying to elicit is that <clears throat> on a sufficient assumption question, whether or not it includes formal logic, which most people, when they say formal logic, what they mean is conditional reasoning, which is if then statements. Um, whether the question actually does have conditional logic, formal logic, on a sufficient assumption question, the one thing that by definition, they're telling you that there is a way to prove the conclusion of the argument correct. And it'll, it'll, it'll take the evidence that we have. And then this one more thing that proves the conclusion of the argument correct. And the one thing that we should always try to do on sufficient assumption questions is predict the answer. It is one of the most predictable types of questions on the entire LSAT if you force yourself to take the time to predict that answer. So when I say, what's your plan on a sufficient assumption question, I would like to hear back, oh, I'm gonna predict the answer. How do we do that? Well, we take the evidence that we have and the conclusion that they wanted, and then we think about how to get from that evidence to that conclusion. And there's always gonna be just one gap and we have to bridge that gap um, but you need to be really clear. It's an opportunity, okay? Think about it this way. It's an opportunity to do the test in an easier way by predicting the answer up front, then go find it in the answer choices uh, instead of doing the test like most novices do, which is to do the test very passively, just kind of read the argument and then get straight into A and then hope that A explains it to them. Uh, which is not the best way to do that question. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Cool. Thank you for your question. Um, anything else while we're getting ready to go with the scheduled content for today's class? All right. Um, everybody does need a daemon free account in order to access these questions. Sorry, I can't get to everybody's questions and comments in the chat, but I have a feeling that my veteran students who have been in a bunch of my other classes will be able to help you out in the chat. I really do appreciate you guys uh, helping each other in the chat. Um, we have an agenda for today, which is right here. And you'll need to log into your free lsatdemon.com account in order to uh, access that agenda. And we're gonna do some games, we're gonna do some LR, and then we're gonna do some reading comp, and that'll be the class for today. Um, again, this is the format that I always follow on Tuesdays and Thursdays for my live classes. We do rotate the order, but I always do a little bit at each uh, topic area. and. Uh, Today, we're gonna to start with a game, which is right here. Jillian's excited to see me do this game. Okay. Um, when Demon asks you whether you want to do um, uh, start challenge or to do um, view only, if you start challenge, then the results of your answers are gonna go into the LSAT Demon drilling algorithm. So it's up to you whether you want your answers to go into that algorithm or not. The daemon also keeps track of how much time you spend on it, though. 
And so I think when I'm teaching these classes, it's probably better that you just do view only for the game and for the RC. For the LRs, I think you can go ahead and start challenge and just do the question on your own and may, might as well add it to your drilling history. But for our game and for our uh, reading comp, you might want to hit view only. Um, let's see. Okay, so somebody was asking for a grouping game. I definitely see this one as a grouping game. Uh, we've got uh, three families owning five buildings. Each family has to own at least one of the buildings. So yeah, I, I would consider this to be a grouping game. I don't really think very much about game types. I don't teach toward game types. I just want you to improvise a solution to every logic game you see. Um, I think something like half of logic games are probably hybrid games anyway. So it's like sort of silly to just be focusing so much on game types. Uh, here we've got five things that need to go into three groups, basically, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, obviously, one or more of these families is going to own more than one of these five buildings because we've got more buildings than we have families to own them. Um, the Williamses have more of the buildings than the Yandels. There is an inference that we can draw right away from that very first rule. Uh, Jasmine, here's that link again, and you will need an lsatdemon.com free account in order to access that, but should be easy to register for. Uh, I'm gonna give you guys a minute to work on this on your own, okay? But the Williamses have to own more buildings than the Yandels. Neither the inn nor the mill belong to the owner of the forge. Uh, either the Trents owned the stable or the Yandels owned the inn or both. I'm looking for connections between the rules. So I'm looking for people who have been mentioned more than once. I see that the inn has been mentioned twice. I also see that the Yandels have been mentioned more than, uh, have been mentioned twice. So those connections might be a good place for me to start my attack on this game. And I definitely do think about attacking these games. I'm gonna make a picture on the whiteboard and it's gonna be a, you know, an attack of this game. Um, that first rule is very powerful. I, I really want you to think about the numbers here. Every family has to have at least one building. So that, is going to account for three of our buildings, right? Three families, they each have to have one. There's three of your buildings. You got two to play with. But if it requires that the Williamses have more than the Yandels, that means something about the Williamses. But it also very powerfully means something about the Yandels. And you know, the, the blunder here is to just not process that at all. Don't even think about it. Just immediately go start answering question number 14, question number 15. That is not the way to do it. The way to do it here is to attack and to think about what it really means about the Yandels specifically. Think about the possibilities for the Yandels. Um, Morsal has a hand up. Hi, yes. So I just tried signing up for the free account, but it's not loading for me. It's like a complete white blank page. Um, I would try hitting refresh. If you need to try a different browser, that might work. Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to yeah, try to I get opened other tabs. I hit refresh and it's, um, same thing. Sorry about that. Try a different browser, uh, maybe try pri private mode. Um, we'll get you sorted out, Marcel. For now, just hang in there. I'm gonna try to get a tech support person in here who can help okay. you. But uh, for now, we gotta keep the class moving. But anyway, sorry about that problem. Um, okay, so I'll give you guys, let's say five minutes to think about a setup for this game, then I'll come back and I'll set it up for you. All right, thanks for being here, good luck.
Okay, I think I'm gonna go ahead and dive in. Um, I, I wanna thank you for being so helpful to each other in the chat. I really do appreciate that. Hopefully we'll get uh, our browser issues sorted and get the demon working for everybody. Most of you are on board though, right? Everybody's got the game up in front of them. We're all doing it. Okay, cool. Um, and I really want to thank you guys, the ones who, when you're able to leave your cameras on during my classes, during all of our classes, it's super duper helpful to me as a teacher to be able to see your faces. Hey, there everybody is. Hi, welcome. Um, <laughs> it, it, and uh, nonverbal feedback really matters a lot. It makes me a much better teacher to be able to see your faces. And I think it makes you a better student too, because there's a little bit of accountability if I can see your face and um, maybe a tiny bit less spacing out that happens if uh, we can see you. So thank you for all of that. By the way, um, if you ever wanna unmute yourself and make a comment or ask a question, you're more than welcome to. You can also just drop stuff in the chat if you wanna do it silently and I'll get to it uh, when I can. Um, okay, so I think everybody's had a chance to bang their head against the wall uh, on this game for a minute. Some of you probably finished the game and thought that it was no problem. Um, there's a kind of a binary thing that happens with these logic games, you know, it's, it's all or nothing. Like you either understand the system, solve the system, realize that it's really not that bad. Um, or you miss something, you misinterpret something, you don't really put the pieces of the puzzle together, in which case it just seems impossible, right? It's all or nothing. You're going to get all five of these questions or you're going to really struggle to get any of these questions. Um, so it's all about solving the system first. Um, the thing that I think is really important about this game, that first rule about the numbers is really important here. We only have five buildings for three families. So one of these families is gonna own more than one building. Uh, we know for sure because of that first rule that the Williamses have to own more than one building. Um, there's a minimum, every family has to own at least one building. And if the Williamses have to own more than the Yandels, then the Yandels um, are gonna have to own at least one building, which means the Williamses have to have two. Uh, at least. Nothing wrong with the Williams is having three. But the big inference in this game, I think, is that the Yandels can only ever have one. And the way you get to that inference is, well, if the Williamses have to have more than the Yandels, think about what would happen if the Yandels had two. If the Yandels had two, then the Williamses would have to have three. And there's your five buildings. But the Trents don't own anything in that scenario. And that breaks the game. The game's not allowed to break. The game has to work. It has to make sense. So this is what we call an inference, which doesn't mean anything magical. It just means must be true. Okay, Inference means must be true. We can infer, it must be true that the Yandels always have exactly one building. The Williamses have at least two. The Williamses could have two or three, but the Yandels are gonna have one and only one. And that's a huge shortcut to the five questions that we're gonna have to answer. And it's much better to learn that before you start trying to grind your way through number 14 or grind your way through number 15. Boy, it's going to be really nice for us to just know right off the bat that the Yandels have exactly one. And I'm going to make a box around that. That's just my shorthand that I use for one and only one. I could also sort of like black out this space here, you know, hey, ain't nothing going there because the Yandels have one. Boy, and if I wanted to have a belt, and suspenders and another belt to really make sure my pants don't fall down. I might put like a one next to the Yandels. Safety first, y'all. Uh, we want to avoid embarrassment. And so um, belt and suspenders is perfectly fine here uh, on our Logic Games solutions. You might notice that I've got two setups on the board. And the reason why I have two setups on the board is that I am going to solve this game using two worlds, or at least I'm gonna begin a setup here with two worlds. Um, the purpose of making worlds, in my view, 
is to make the games vastly easier, but specifically to eliminate rules and thereby make the games vastly easier. So the rule that I'm still not done with is that very first rule, the Williams is owned more than the Yandels. Now I know that the Williamses have to have at least two buildings, and I know that the Yandels are gonna have only one building, but I still don't know whether the Williamses have two or three buildings. And I see that as an opportunity to split the to split into two scenarios, right? So this may or may not turn out to be like a total home run, but I do know that when I make worlds, it frequently is a home run and home runs are good. <laughs> if you hit a home run on one at bat and you strike out on the next at bat, you're still the best player out there. And so it's okay to like make worlds and have it not be a home run every single time. Um, <clears throat> here's what I'm thinking though. The Trents might have two buildings. So that would be one, two, three, four, five, all five of my buildings. Or the Williamses might have three buildings. And there's my one, two, three, four, five buildings. And with this move, I now can't ever break that first rule. And I don't have to worry about the numbers anymore. And the distribution of buildings now, at least numbers wise, the distributions are set, right? I've got a world where it's two, two, one, and I've got a world where it's one, three, one. And these aren't just random scenarios. These are the only possible solutions for the game. This is all and only uh, the, the ways that the numbers can be distributed here. Any questions or comments about what I've done so far? I haven't even touched the second rule, haven't touched the third rule. I'm solely thinking about the numbers. We good? Excellent. All right, so let's think about these other rules then. I mean, neither the inn nor the mill belonged to the owner of the forge. Hmm. Boy, it would be really nice then to put the forge here or to put the forge here uh, or to put the forge here because this is another solo spot, right? This is our two, two, one world and this is our one, three, one world. And since the forge can't be owned by the same person as the mill or the inn, if we sequester the forge here or here or here, that would be good for us. If we put the forge here or here, then you know we got to be careful about not putting the inn there or not putting the mill there. If we put the forge here, then we start thinking about, oh boy, that that's kind of problematic, right? Um, it may still work though because we do have five buildings. If we put the forge here and then we split the inn and the mill uh, here and here, maybe it does work to have the forge there. I don't really know. I haven't yet been able to draw any big inferences about that second rule. So I'm just gonna kind of leave it there for a minute. And I'm gonna think about the last rule. The last rule says either the Trents owned the stable or the Yandels owned the, the inn or both. So the Trents have to have the stable or the Yandels have to have the inn or both. And and with that, I, I almost want to start my setup over, which, by the way, is perfectly fine, okay? I thought two worlds based on the numbers was going to do something, but I actually think two worlds based on that last rule is going to do even more. And so, but this isn't like wasted effort, okay? Like having learned that it's got to be a 2 2 one or a one three one. If I had a booklet of scratch paper in front of me, which is what they're going to do on the actual test, I would leave this, okay? I, I would just leave it on, on the top of the page, and I would essentially start over. And let me show you what the start over would look like. I'm still going to leave the Yandels having exactly one, because they have always exactly one. And I'm still going to leave two spots at least for the Williamses. 
but I'm going to let that other spot float. <clears throat> and I'm going to make two worlds based on the last rule. There's a couple different ways that I can do it, but I want to eliminate that last rule. And I can do it, I think, with <clears throat> the Yandels. Uh, I, I, there's actually two different ways I could do it. Either the Trents do own the stable or they don't, or the Yandels do have the in or they don't. And either one of those would be a perfectly adequate way to split this game into two worlds. So let's just randomly pick, okay, how about I'll decide Yandels in, and I'm choosing that because there's another rule that, that mentions in. And Don Devi is asking a really good question here. What about the or both? But it doesn't actually do anything. The requirement is that the Trents have the stable or the Yandels have the in. Both is acceptable, but both is not required. So I don't really need to think about the what's acceptable. Everything is acceptable unless it's not. So the fact that that's acceptable isn't really relevant to me. What I'm gonna do, what, just watch this move, okay? This move is gonna eliminate the rule, which is the point. The Yandels either do or do not own the in. Is it true that the Yandels either do or do not own the in always? There's no way that they can like partially own the in, like a Schrodinger's cat type of a situation, no? Okay, so they either do or do not own the in. Great. When they do own the in, that rule cannot possibly be broken anymore because both is possible. The trends, maybe they have the stable, maybe they don't. I don't care. In this world, it's irrelevant whether the trends have the stable because the Yandels have the in, so the rule is good. Everybody got that part? In the, in the world where the Yandels do not own the in, the rule requires that the Trents own the stable. And with that move, I now eliminate that third rule. That third rule, I, it can't hurt me anymore. I can't break the rule. Therefore, I don't care about the rule. And I want to make sure that Don Devi specifically gets this. You can give me one of these. <laughs> okay, I just got it. Cool. So it, it's it, it, the rule has been eliminated because in this world, the Yandels do own the in which means, yeah, fine, whatever. The trends do or don't have the stable. It's just irrelevant. I don't care. So the rule doesn't matter to me anymore. Down here, when the Andels don't have the in, well, then, yeah, that, that third rule forces the trends to have the stable. And the rule now can't be broken here or here. Therefore, I don't care about that rule anymore. It drops out of my consciousness. Layla, what can I do for you? So I did three worlds and one of them, I did the last one where it was both just so I wouldn't yeah. have to think about it. Do but you think you don't, that's helpful at all? No, I don't. <laughs> no, I do not. And I know that a lot of you wanted to do that, but I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. That third world doesn't matter. In this world, yeah, maybe they do have the stable. Maybe they don't have the stable. Who cares? It's not going to change anything. It doesn't matter, okay? So generally speaking, the or both aspect, when, the, when you see a rule like that, and if you think about making worlds based on that rule, you probably don't need to care about the or both. There's probably a way that you can eliminate the rule by, oh, okay, here's the minimum condition. And if that's not satisfied, then this other thing has to happen. But the or both is irrelevant. Unless it says, either this or that, but not both, right? In that case, it would be like, well, when they have the in, these guys don't have the stable. And when they do have, sorry, and when they don't have the in, then these guys do have the stable and vice versa. 
So, or, but not both would do a lot, but the, or both is acceptable is just like, yeah, fine. I mean, other things are acceptable, who cares? All right, hopefully that was helpful. Um, so now let me kind of cycle back through these rules, right? Williams's always have to have more than the Yandels. That's done because I've got two spots for, at least for the Williamses and the Yandels are gonna have exactly one. So I don't care about that rule anymore. The second rule says, neither the inn nor the mill belong to the owner of the forge. So let me think about that for a minute. Um, the, the inn and the forge aren't gonna matter in this world because the Yandels do have the inn and they only have the inn. So the fact that the inn and the forge can't be together doesn't matter in this world, but the mill and the forge really does matter in this world. And since there's only two groups and we've got the mill and the forge that have to be owned by somebody but can't be owned by the same somebody, <clears throat> we can go ahead and put mill and forge and then put a handle to indicate one way or the other, uh, either way will do it and that'll take care of it. And so in this world, I no longer care about the rule that neither the inn nor the mill belong to the forge. Everybody with me that far? Okay. In this world, I do still have to kind of care. I've got inn, mill and forge. The Yandels are not gonna own the inn. It would be really nice if they owned the mill or the forge. Um, but in these two groups, I am gonna have to worry about, particularly I'm gonna have to worry about wherever the forge goes. And I'm thinking if the forge goes here, what's gonna happen? If the forge goes here, I guess they'd have to have F and G. That'd be the only way they can satisfy their two things. Um, <clears throat> but the forge could still go here and the forge could still go here, and then I wouldn't have to worry about it. I think what I might do in real life, if I had more space, I think I might split this into two. There's a world where the Williamses do have the forge. Uh, by the way, the, what that would look like if they did have the forge, they now can't have the mill and they can't have the inn, but they have to have something and it's not S. So the only thing they could possibly have would be G. And I do have another thing that has to go somewhere and it would have to go with the Trents. And now Yandels can't have the inn, but there's only the inn in the mill left. And so it turns out that they would then have to have the mill, which would then force the other thing, which is, what is the other thing? Oh, inn, the inn would have to go over here. And I think that that's the only way to solve the game uh, <clears throat> in the world where the Yandels don't have the inn, then uh, if you give the forge to the Williamses, then it's gonna end up being exactly this. If the Williamses don't have the forge, then I think you've got other solutions. And so I would have another world where the Williamses don't have the forge. I would have split this into two. But you know, there's a million different ways to skin these cats. And, so what I actually would do, or what I'm gonna do right now, is I'm gonna see what happens if I just sort of leave this world open. Um, I'm gonna make note of the fact that the inn and the forge and the inn and the mill hate each other. And I'm gonna be particularly interested, oh wait, sorry, it's inn and mill hate the forge, my bad. So in and forge and mill and forge hate each other. And these rules are still in play in this world. I also have a, a, an additional spot that might go to the Williamses, might go to the Trents. A couple different choices you can make from here. And I'm sure if you watch any of the videos that we have, uh, you'll see me doing the game multiple times probably, you'll see Ben doing the game multiple times probably, and you'll see that we're gonna not do it exactly the same way every time. It is a highly improvisational approach. And I like to demonstrate that in my classes. Questions before I move on to uh, trying to answer some of these? Elka? Yes, hey. <laughs> I couldn't find the sign. No, that's uh, fine. Okay, I think someone answered it, but I still don't. Okay, for nor, like neither nor. Um, 
okay, how do you like, how should I think about it? Like, cause I always think like, okay, nor by itself. Like when I say, let's say if it just said the end nor the mill cannot belong to the forge, I would just take it as um, both of them cannot be there. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's all that means. Okay, I feel like I overthink it. No, they could have said the forge hates the mill and the inn. The forge can't be owned by the same person as the mill, can't be owned by the same person as the inn. I think you figured it out. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good. Evangeline? Hello. I have a quick question. In regards to setting up worlds, do you recommend setting up one or two worlds before we actually dive into the questions, like actually spending ample time on that? Yes, I'm demonstrating exactly what I would do in real life to solve okay. this game. This is not an academic exercise. This is like, if I was if I was faced with this game, I would have been thinking about the numbers, and then ideally, I would have saw that I would have seen that last rule, and I would have gone, oh, well, you know, there's really only two ways to satisfy this. I mean, if the Yandels have the in, then we're good. But if the Yandels don't have the in, then the Trents have to own the stable. And I would split that into those two worlds, <clears throat> thereby eliminating that last rule. And the, the point of all of that, Evangeline, is that we get to then play a simpler game from this point forward. Okay? Because a game with fewer rules, it's just a simpler game. Mm -hmm. Right? You guys ever played a board game that has like a giant 50 page rule book? Well, if we tear some of those pages out, the game might be more boring that way, but boring is good on the Hellsat Logic games. We want to simplify these games in such a way that we, we have less to process. We don't want to be trying to process all of these rules at once. We want to process them and then move on to just you know other stuff. Okay, um, I do have a, I've never really dealt with worlds until I started doing with LSAT Demon, which I'm still really fairly new to it. So when it does come to worlds, like say if there's another rule that needs to be, like that is added with like these rules, would then I then create three worlds to compensate that? Or is sometimes, it just- so, Sometimes we'll, we'll make four, five, six. Okay. I, I taught, I substitute taught uh, one of our classes the other day, uh, we have a fundamentals class for logic games. Mm -hmm. And I just filled in because somebody couldn't make it. And I substitute taught that class that I don't usually teach. We did two games. On the first game, I actually made seven worlds. On the second game, I ended up making just one world. Okay. And so the answer is, it depends. I mean, what are the opportunities? Where are the limitations in the game? Where are the opportunities to eliminate rules by uh, making worlds. Um, Matt Dumont is here. Matt, uh, can you say hi quick so everybody sees you? Hello. How's it going, everyone? There he is. Hey, Matt. Uh, Matt is uh, a rising 2L at the University of Maryland Law School, and he's been with uh, the Demon since the beginning. Um, he is uh, teaches a bunch of our logic games classes, and um, He's uh, here to help out for the rest of the class. You can send Matt private uh, messages in the chat if you want. So if you want to ask backgroundy kind of stuff, even tech support kind of stuff, Matt can help you out with whatever um, you need. Thank you, Matt, for posting um, those two links to uh, classes that I've done in the past on the purpose of making worlds. Um, awesome. There's a lot of practice to be done, as Matt, I'm sure, will endorse. Matt, how many logic games did you do uh, before you finally got your final official LSAT score? Um, I mean, by then I probably did all of them. Simple as that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Matt, am I correct when I say that the logic games is a good test of how hard you're going to have to work once you actually get to law school? Absolutely. Um, and I would also argue it's a really good test of statutory interpretation. Ah, say more. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, once once y'all are in criminal law, um, uh, especially that's going to deal with a lot of statutes, there's a lot of like, if A, then B, um, if C, then D um, type things, which is all stuff that you're learning um, on the logic games and the LSAT in general. And so um, the logic games are not useless, y'all. They are a great um, skill set to learn and uh, really, um, really uh, take in and, and acknowledge the importance of.
Yeah. And there's some science that shows that uh, studying for the LSAT actually changes the structure of your brain. Uh, I think it makes you a better, more rational thinker uh, to, to train yourself in, in this test that is extremely literal. Uh, it's convoluted. It's poorly written intentionally to see if you'll sort it all out because those statutes, as Matt will surely endorse, those statutes are god awfully written, if that's a word. And uh, <laughs> you, you better get used to processing. If you think that this stuff is complicated, uh, boy, those um, the the statutes that you're going to encounter are way way worse than this. Okay, um, let me answer some of these questions, and then we'll move on to uh, some logical reasoning. Uh, this first question, number fourteen, is a what we call a list question. And these questions can always be done by, by a very simple process of elimination, okay? If you're really struggling to get started on the LSAT logic games and you just wanna like, this is one that's basically a free point. If you just take a rule and knock out as many answer choices as you can with that rule. So one at a time, Williamses have to have more than the Yandels. I look at A, I see two for the Williamses, one for the Yandels, no problem. B, two for the Williamses, one for the Yandels, no problem. Same with C. D, one for the Williamses, two for the Yandels? Problem. Violates that rule, therefore D is eliminated. And I just click the little, uh, it's very faint, but there's a little minus sign in the demon. I click that and that answer is gone. I look at E, I see two for the Williamses, two for the Yandels, does that work? No, the Williamses have to have more than the Yandels. So E is also eliminated. With that one rule, we know that the answer is not D and not E. Second rule says, uh, neither the inn nor the mill belong to the owner of the forge. I would actually be looking for the forge there because the forge is the one that hates both the inn and the mill. So A, the forge is by itself, that's fine. B, the forge is by itself, that's fine. C, the forge is with the mill. Not fine, C is eliminated. I'm down to A and B, last rule. Either the Trents own the stable or the Yandels own the inn or both. I really don't care about the both part. I just wanna make sure that at a minimum, either the Trents owned the stable or the Yandels owned the inn. A, Trents have the stable, that's the end of my analysis. B, Trents do not own the stable. Yandels also do not own the inn. So B violates the third rule. I have narrowed it down to just one answer, A, and that is 100% the answer to this question. At the Demon, we teach a process for these games. Spend all the time you want on the setup, including making worlds if you see an opportunity to do so. Then when you go to the questions, we're going to answer the list question first. Then we're going to answer the questions that start with if. These if questions tend to give us a new restriction uh, a limited uh, version of the game, which tends to be kind of easier to sort out and it allows us to learn more about the way the game works. So I would skip 15 briefly uh, to number 16 because it says if, if the Yandels owned the mill. In a world where the Yandels own the mill, I know that I'm not in this world. In this world, the Yandels own the inn, which means the Trents and the Williamses are gonna flip-flop the mill and the forge. This is the world where the Yandels are allowed to own the mill. And I would make a new version of this. I'm actually just gonna use two different colors of dry erase. When the Yandels own the mill, then what happens? Well, I mean, I know for sure that the Trents own the stable, which if this was a really easy question, that could just be the answer. Uh, but does something more happen when the Yandels own the mill? Well, I know that the mill hates the forge, which now I don't have to worry about anymore, but I do still have to worry about the inn and the forge. So the Williamses and the Trents are gonna have to uh, flip-flop with the inn and the forge. So that's a handle. These guys, the inn and the forge can be owned. One of them has to have one of them and one of them has to have the other one. But that now does mean that there's only one player left, which is the granary, G. And the Williamses need a second thing. 
So the granary has to go to the Williamses. And if this was a little bit of a harder question, that would be the answer. And guess what? It is. Number 16, D, Williamses own the granary. Must be true anytime the Yandels own the mill. So that was a uh, process of like, first, what world am I in if the Yandels own the mill? Can't happen here. Has to happen here. Then I, I made a version of the world where the Yandels do own the mill. What happens from there? Well, the inn and the forge still have to be separated, which means the Williamses are gonna end up with the granary for sure. And that's our answer. Number 17 says, if one of the families owned both the granary and the inn, um, I noticed right away that my diagram from number 16 is a version of a way that number 17 can be satisfied. It's totally possible that the Williamses can have both the granary and the inn in this exact diagram. So it, it would have looked like this. That's definitely acceptable. Um, it also, I guess, would have been acceptable here for the Yandels to own the granary instead of the Williamses. So the, these two could be flip-flopped in that solution. That's something that I would do very rarely to actually use one of the if diagrams and then sort of tweak it for the next question. But it's like, sometimes you get lucky and you just take those opportunities if you see them. Um, which one of the following could be true? I don't know, I might get lucky here. A, can the Trents own the granary? Uh, maybe, but not in, not in this solution. So, oh, wait a second. And I, I did just make a mistake, didn't I? Did you guys catch me? You all got to call me on my bullshit. If I'm going to make a mistake, you should say something. This question says, if one of the families owned the granary and the inn. And I was like, oh, so these two can flip-flop. No, they can't. Not if the, not if the family's going to own the granary and the inn. I see Piper shaking her head. I know Piper, you caught me and you didn't, you didn't call me on it. That's, you, you gotta, you gotta say something. Um, oh, Alexandria had it in the chat. Okay, cool. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, this is a possible solution for number 17. It's not the only solution for number 17. So I may or may not get lucky here. I'm trying to get lucky. We'll see. Can the Trents own the granary here? No. Can the Trents own the mill here? No. Can the Williamses own the forge here? No. Can the Williamses own the stable here? No. Can the Yandels own the inn here? No. Hmm, damn. Okay, so as it turns out, I was not able to get lucky using my diagram from number uh, 16 to answer number 17. Let me think about it. That last answer is interesting because I have a world where the Yandels own the inn. Question is, is it possible in that world for one of the families to own the granary and the inn? No, it's not. Um, <clears throat> so it is not possible that the Yandels own the inn and also the granary. So the answer for number 17 just cannot possibly be E. What world am I in if the inn and the granary are owned by the same player? Clearly not this world clearly has to be this world. I've already thought about a solution where the Williamses had I and G both. You know what? And it can't go here either because that would be three things for the Trents. So actually the only way to solve number 17 would look like this. Williamses would have to have ING, which I had that part. But we do still have the mill and the forge to play with. The mill and the forge hate each other. That's okay because one of them is going to go here. The inn and the forge also hate each other, which means the forge has to go here. Uh, sorry. The inn and the forge hate each other, which means that the uh, forge can't go here, but the mill could. So that's the important, that's the important bit, is that if this is the forge, then the mill goes uh, here or here. I think I see it now. 
Um, N and the forge hate each other. So the forge is definitely not going here. <clears throat> Mill forge would be acceptable. Forge mill would be acceptable. And the one other acceptable thing is that if this is the forge, the Williamses could have the mill. So the Williamses could have three things. All right, let me see now if I got there. Is it possible that the Trents own the granary? No, not in this world. Is it possible that the Trents own the mill? Yeah, if this is the forge, then the mill can go over here, no problem. And finally, I got there, that's our answer. I don't know, a little bit of a cautionary tale there. I tried to get lucky and I was just yelling at you earlier about how safety first is important on the logic games. And if safety is important, then why are you trying to get lucky? <laughs> this question wasn't that hard. And I think I ended up kind of like wasting a bunch of time because I tried to get lucky on it. Uh, number 17 is B. Number 18 says, if the Trents owned exactly one of the buildings, um, do I know what world I'm in? That's always my first question. Do I know what world I'm in if the Trents owned exactly one of the buildings? I don't think so. I, I think that in this world, it's okay for the Trents to just own the mill or the forge. Um, the Williamses would have to though have a third thing. In this world, uh, it is possible that the Trents own only the stable. The Williamses again would have to have the third thing. In this world, that's going to be tricky because the forge needs to go somewhere and it's not going to be able to go here because the forge hates both the mill and the inn. So in this world, if, this, if the Trents own, own only one thing, the forge has to go here, which makes this I, M, and G. In this world, uh, same thing actually, or not same thing, but I got to worry about the forge, right? Forge has to be set, uh, separate from the inn and the mill. So, oh, actually, which is okay. Yeah, it's okay because in this world, the forge already is separated from the inn and the mill. So in this world, you just end up with a uh, granary and stable. Turns out there's two solutions for number 18, uh, two worlds. This one still has some flexibility. I don't care where the M and the F are. Which could be the building that the Trents owned though. Uh, well, looks like they could own the mill, the forge or the stable. And if there's an answer that says mill, forge and stable, then that's just the answer. Yep, number 18 E. All right, just one question left. Back to number 15, which one of the following is a pair of buildings that cannot both have been owned by the Trents? <laughs> Here I would use my diagrams, whatever diagrams I made for number 16, number 17 and number 18. I definitely would look at all of the different buildings that have been owned by the Trents. And I would eliminate any answer that listed a building that I had seen previously owned by the Trents. Uh, in this diagram, I know that the Trents could have owned the mill, the forge, and the stable. So the only question is, you know, are they allowed to own the inn? Are they allowed to own the granary? I'm not sure. Um, but I know they can own S, M, and F, which gets rid of A, B, C, and D. And at that point, I would confidently pick E and move on because it's the last question in the game. I know for sure that the Trents are allowed to own M, F, and S. And that eliminates A, B, C, and D for this question. Uh, are they allowed to own? Oh, <laughs> and now you guys are saving me. God, I'm... you know what happens in this thing? Cascade failure. I make one mistake earlier and then I get rattled and then I make later mistakes. And it, it's, thank you. Thank you for catching me here. I didn't read the damn question. The question says, which one of the following is a pair of buildings that cannot both have been owned by the Trents? Which means that my process here was entirely broken. I was about to confidently pick E and miss it. 
wouldn't have been the world's worst disaster because it was the last question in the game and I would have just missed it and moved on to the next game, which I don't love, but it's better than, you know, like spending 10 minutes on a question and missing it anyway. Uh, they're not asking me what buildings can the Trents never own. They're asking me for a pair of buildings that can't both be owned by the Trents. <sighs> Boy, what do I know about the Trents? Well, I do know, and, and this probably I'm going to answer it in two seconds once I actually answer the question that they asked me. I do know that the Trents always own either the stable or M or F. Always. They have to own one of those buildings. So if there's an answer that lists none of those buildings, then that would be the answer for sure. Otherwise, I'm looking for a pair that, for whatever reason, if the Trents owned both of them, it would break the game. Um, they for sure can't own the forge with the inn or the forge with the mill, but none of the answers have that. That would like be too easy. Can they have the forge and the granary at the same time? Yeah, in this world, I mean, you split these, Forge granary, the Williamses end up with mill stable. That seems like that works. I don't see any problem with that. I'm looking for one that's going to break the game. Can the Trents have both the granary and the mill at the same time? In this world, mill, granary, Williamses get forge and stable, no problem. Can the Trents have the granary and the stable at the same time? Uh, that would put us into this world. Trents get stable and granary. I think the Yandels have to take the forge. Williamses get the inn and the mill. That looks like that works to me. Can the Trents have both the inn and the mill? Oh, there it is actually. And my worlds have already answered it. The, the Trents cannot have both the inn and the mill because in this world, that would give them three things, which they're not allowed to have. The Williamses have to have two and the Yandels have to have one. So the Trents just can't have three things. In this world, they can't have the mill and the inn because in this world, the Yandels have the inn. And so that turns out to be the answer, number 15, D. I made a bit of a mess of that one, y'all. That's gonna happen from time to time. Um, sorry about that. Let's move on to some logical reasoning, yeah? All right, here's a question for you. Uh, I'm gonna plug it into the chat. I'll give you guys uh, a couple minutes to uh, do your best on it. You can just shoot me the thumbs up when you're ready for an explanation. Good luck. All right, let's see how this one goes. This is uh, <clears throat> test 73, section two, question seven. Party X has recently been accused by its opposition, party Y, of accepting international campaign contributions, which is illegal. There are a couple facts there. I think we're meant to accept as a fact that accepting international campaign contributions is illegal. They have, it is a fact that they have been accused by their opposition of accepting those contributions. So they have been accused of doing something that is illegal. The question, I guess, is did they actually do it or not? Such accusations are, however, ill founded. Okay, so that sounds like the conclusion of the argument. I'm expecting them to provide some more evidence in favor of that conclusion. Why do you think that these are ill-founded accusations? Probably what they mean by ill-founded accusations is you didn't actually do it. Um, is that what you meant? Do you really mean that they didn't actually do it? Let's see. <clears throat> Three years ago, Party Y itself was involved in a scandal in which it was discovered that its national committee seriously violated campaign laws. Wah, wah. I'm disappointed, uh, but that means that this is probably going to turn out to be a very easy question for me. If I can spot the bullshit in the argument, 
I'm already 95% of the way to answering the question, okay? And the bullshit here, unless you watch too much news on TV and actually believe it, the bullshit here is obvious, okay? This is some kindergarten style. Well, I mean, the people making the accusation, they themselves have already done this thing that they're accusing, so it's okay, you know? It's like yelling at your kid, like, hey, don't hit that other kid. And they go, well, they did it first. Yeah, I don't care that they did it first. <laughs> you, what I said was, don't hit the kid. And <clears throat> them hitting you first is a separate issue. And that's exactly my response to this argument. Do you guys see that? If you see that now, it's gonna save you a ton of time later because as I hope everybody can clearly recognize here, the answer choices for this question are long. The passage itself is short, but each answer choice here is gonna be its own whole argument because the question turns out to say, which one of the following contains flawed reasoning most similar to the flawed reasoning in the argument above. This matching flaw question type is unnecessarily intimidating to many of you. Like quick show of hands, who hates parallel reasoning questions? Who hates matching matching whatever? Okay, you guys can all, you, you don't need to have your hand up. <clears throat> These are much easier than you think they are. The key here, and boy, they gave you a chance to bail yourself out. They are telling you that that was a flawed pattern of reasoning. And what many people do is they just, they read that and they go, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. And they start reading A and then reading B and then reading C. And at that point, you have failed because they are telling you to match the flaw, but you don't know what the flaw was in the first place. So you're going in to match something where, you know, it's like playing the little match game that kids play, you know, turn over the tiles. Well, you don't, you can't try to match if you didn't look at the first tile, you don't know what you're trying to match. And that's what's happening here if you just start reading A and B and C. People go into this real weird, like they think that they're supposed to be like matching individual words or matching individual phrases. No, no, you're supposed to be matching the flaw, okay? So the flaw here was just because they themselves had previously done this thing does not mean that they are wrong when they accuse someone else of doing that same thing. Matter of fact, who would know better? <laughs> you guys were actually guilty of this and now you're accusing someone else of doing it? Well, you guys know how it's done. So uh, yeah, I mean, the fact that you previously did it does not change my assessment of your accusation at all. I might call you a hypocrite. I might bring up the fact that you have previously done it, but I don't get to say that your accusations are ill-founded because why couldn't you both have done this illegal thing? So that's the flaw I'm looking for. Just because you did it in the past doesn't mean that you can't ever accuse anyone else of doing it in the future. You could still be right about that. You don't have to be wrong about that just because you've previously done it. A says, the plaintiff accuses the defendant of violating campaign laws, but the accusations are ill-founded. Sounds good so far. Sounds like a perfect match. While the defendant's actions may violate certain laws, they are not immoral because the laws in question are unjust. That's not the same at all. What? That's not the same logic. The flaw that I was looking for was, well, you did that thing before, so now you have to be wrong when you accuse someone else. A is about the morality, justness of the laws. What? That's just a completely different argument. Terrible answer. I don't care how many of the words in that answer you like. It does not contain the flaw that we were looking to match and is therefore 100% wrong. B, the plaintiff accuses the defendant of violating campaign laws, but these accusations show the plaintiff to be hypocritical because the plaintiff has engaged in similar conduct. How many of you thought that that was a good answer? I know that some of you did. Yeah, okay, thank you for being honest. The problem with B is that I don't think it's actually flawed. 
look at what they're actually saying with B. With B, what they're saying is you accuse them of doing this thing, but you know, that's kind of hypocritical because you did it yourself, which is actually a reasonable thing to say. It's not a flawed thing to say. It's actually a valid enough argument to accuse someone of hypocrisy if they're attacking someone for doing the exact same thing that they themselves have done. And it's different from the given argument because the given argument said, oh no, these accusations are ill-founded. In other words, wrong. Um, a couple of you, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Jillian, for helping out in the chat. Um, September saying, I chose it too. I didn't think it sounded flawed. Well, that means it's not the right answer because you're looking to match a flawed argument. If it's, you didn't think it was flawed, then that is for sure not the answer. B is certainly about a similar topic. You know, it comes close because hypocrisy is certainly relevant here to this discussion, but the given argument actually wasn't about hypocrisy. The conclusion of that argument was these accusations are ill-founded and what they meant was, you don't have evidence, you can't prove it, they didn't do it, they're innocent. And um, B didn't make that conclusion. B just said, hey, yeah, I know, but you guys did the same thing, so that's kind of hypocritical, don't you think? Which isn't actually flawed and therefore isn't the answer. C says, the plaintiff accuses the defendant of violating campaign laws, and in the past, courts have declared such violations illegal. That's actually good so far. Um, they've been accused of this illegal thing. Nevertheless, because the plaintiff recently engaged in actions that were similar to those of the defendant, the plaintiff's accusations are ill-founded and that's gonna be the answer. Notice that they reached the exact same conclusion there. Ill-founded, ill-founded. Not ill-founded hypocrisy. Even though B and C are about the exact same topics, B is actually not flawed and C is, and that's why C is gonna turn out to be the right answer. D, the plaintiff accuses the defendant of violating campaign laws, but these accusations are ill-founded. They are clearly an attempt to stir up controversy because of just two weeks before the election. What, timing before the election? What's that have to do with anything? It's not similar. C is like the exact same argument as we were looking to match. D is bringing up this whole new idea about timing, which I just don't see how that's similar at all. E, the plaintiff accuses the defendant of voting only for campaign laws that would favor the defendant's party. This accusation is ill-founded, however, because it attacks the defendant's motivations instead of addressing the arguments. Um, <clears throat> that's actually uh, a valid logical argument. In LSAT terms, um, what, what E is saying is, hey, uh, <clears throat> you are attacking the motives rather than attacking the actual policy. And it's a problem to attack people's motives rather than to attack the actual policy. Um, so, but I don't see any flaw in that reasoning, certainly not the same flaw in the reasoning. Uh, the answer here is C, because it's the only one that actually makes the same flaw. <clears throat> Um, Scott and Corey, I would remind you that on logical reasoning, we definitely need to read all five answers. It's pretty plain here that the test makers wrote B and they thought, oh, that's a really good trap. Let me just go ahead and put the correct answer immediately after that and catch all y'all who are lazy, trying to take shortcuts and just, uh, you know, deciding on an answer before you really consider the other answers. Because like, I don't know how, if you read both B and C, I just don't know how you eliminate C. Is it the courts thing? All right, let's, uh, the courts thing there actually turned out not to be relevant because whether it is illegal or courts have determined it to be illegal, it says the same thing, just it's illegal. Um, Okay, here's another one. Probably not gonna make it through all of these logical reasoning questions because I do wanna make sure that I reserve time for reading comp, but here's one more LR.
This is a bit of a tough one as questions numbered uh, 12 tend to go. The, you know, for those of you who are brand new to this whole thing, um, the earlier questions in each section tend to be easier and they, they get harder as we get deeper into the test. You'll start encountering some of the hardest questions in normally in like the late teens is where the real hard ones start to pop up. This one um, <clears throat> is a bit of a challenge. It says, the chairperson should not have released the election commission's report to the public for, which means because, which means here comes evidence, which means the thing I just said is probably my conclusion. So I think they're trying to prove here that the chairperson should not have released the election commission's report to the public. Why? Well, the chairperson did not consult any other members of the commission about releasing the report before having it released. It's a fairly simple argument, actually. Hey, you didn't consult anybody. Therefore, you shouldn't have released it. My, my counter to that would be, well, why do I have to consult anybody? I'm the chairperson. Really, you want me to consult everybody before I release a report? Why did you elect me chairperson? Or maybe I appointed myself chairperson for life. Uh, either way, I don't have to, who do I, I don't have to report to anybody. I'm the chairperson, okay? Um, it turns out to be a sufficient assumption question. And there was, in the Q&A today, there was a little bit about sufficient assumption questions. And what I said there was, predict the answer. Resist the urge, my friends, to immediately start reading A and B and C and D and E. Four out of five of those are wrong. And they're professionally written wrong answers. So why would you dive right into a bunch of answers that like when you read A, it's 80% wrong. And when you read B, it's 80% wrong. Same with C, same with D, same with E. You're doing the test the hard way, especially on sufficient assumption questions. If you don't take the time to, to have a real clear idea of what it, what, what it would have to say in order to make the conclusion properly inferred. Properly in, inferred means proven, okay? I said earlier that inferred means must be true. So the argument's conclusion must be true if which one of the following is assumed. They're asking you, what they're telling you, they're giving you a huge opportunity, y'all. They're giving you an opportunity here to predict like exactly what the answer is. I know that the evidence here is you didn't consult any other members of the commission about releasing the report. The conclusion is, so you shouldn't have done that. To bridge that gap, to make the conclusion properly inferred, to make the conclusion true, I need a rule that says, if you didn't consult anybody, then you shouldn't have released it. Okay, so heading into the answers, my prediction is, if you didn't consult anybody, then you shouldn't have released it. A says, <clears throat> it would have been permissible for the chairperson to release the commission's report to the public only if most other members of the commission had first given their consent. Hmm. What do we think about that one? I was looking for, you needed to consult before you released the report. You have to consult, otherwise you shouldn't release the report. A says something slightly different. A says, well, you shouldn't release the report unless they have given their consent. Well, is it possible to get consent if you didn't consult them in the first place? I kind of don't think so. 
And we'd have to be getting into some real complicated territory about implied consent. And I think the reason why this question turns out to be a little bit tricky is because those two topics, you know, those two concepts are a little bit different. But there's a pretty easy argument to be made that if you didn't consult them at all, then they could not possibly have given their consent. You just went ahead and did it. You didn't consult them. They couldn't have consented. And I think that's gonna turn out to be the answer. B says, all of the members of the commission had signed the report prior to its release. Wait a second. How does that help prove that the chairperson should not have released the election commission's report to the public? If it's a fact that all these people actually signed the damn thing, well then, what? <laughs> if they signed it, then that seems like they're good. Um, B, if anything, looks like a weakener. I don't see how that proves our conclusion. That seems like a pretty bad answer. <clears throat> C, the chairperson would not have been justified in releasing the commission's report if any members of the commission had serious reservations about the report's content. I bet some of you thought that that was a tempting answer. Um, I see some of this, yeah, thank you. Um, that, that I, I understand where you're coming from, but the problem with C is that we actually don't know whether any of these members of the commission did have serious reservations about the report's content. Maybe some of them had minor reservations about the report's content. Maybe all of them on the commission thought that the report was awesome. Nonetheless, it still could be incorrect for the chairperson to just go ahead and release the report to the public, right? I mean, this whole argument could be about like, hey, dude, it's fine this time because the it's fine. This, yeah, it was good to go. And so I'm glad that you didn't make a major disaster here. But next time, before you release stuff to the public, you need to ask us for our consent. See what I'm saying? There's room for the person to still be guilty, uh, even if C, sorry, <laughs> C does not force this person to be guilty. Um, and we need something that forces the chairperson to be guilty. C just doesn't get you all the way there. D, the chairperson, <clears throat> uh, the chairperson would have been justified in releasing the report only if each of the commission's members would have agreed to its being released, uh, had they been consulted. D is an overcomplicated answer, which almost always means it's wrong. There's so much there that you probably, if you picked it, you didn't even understand what it said. D is about, well, you can only release it if they would have agreed to its being released had they been consulted, which they actually weren't. D doesn't make it required that you consult. D says, well, you can release it only if they would have agreed, if you would have consulted them, which these people might have done, potentially. And so maybe actually D says, yeah, you're fine, because they all would have agreed if you would have consulted them. D does not make this person guilty. A makes them guilty. E, some members of the commission would have preferred that the report not be released to the public. That's not actually the point. You, you got to focus on the argument and you've got to make a good prediction. The argument was you didn't consult, therefore you shouldn't have released. It's not about their actual objections. All that was wanted here was consultation. According to whoever made this argument, it might have been okay to consult. Everybody says, absolutely not, do not release. And the chairperson just goes ahead and releases anyway. Because it wasn't about, it was not, it wasn't about like whether they liked the policy or didn't like the policy. It was about did you give them the opportunity to say something? The only answer here that turns out to work is A. It's not possible to uh, consent without being consulted. We know for a fact that these people were not consulted. A then says, well, yeah, you shouldn't have released the report. And that's why the answer is A. Uh, Amber, are you here? Can you talk to me for a second? Hi, I'm here. Hi, Amber. Amber said, 
if any in one of these answer choices seemed too strong, so I ruled it out. Amber, why do you think that something too strong automatically rules out an answer choice? I mean, not in all cases. I think sometimes it's if it's required for the argument, then you want something strong. But for this one, for it to be true, it was just that some of the people had to not agree it, not all of them. So I wasn't looking for all. I was looking for some. Amber, you are, I think, partially maybe correct, but I think you also might be thinking about it exactly backward. Oh, gotcha. Well, I still got it right, so that's good. <laughs> that's good. That's yeah. great. That is, that is excellent. But if we are going to talk about answer choice strength, Sufficient assumption questions uh, ask us to assume that an answer choice is true. And then if it is true, does it prove the argument? And because of that, sufficient assumption questions actually tend to prefer answers with stronger wording. So far from dismissing an answer because it has too strong of language, on a sufficient assumption question or a strengthened question or a weakened question or anything that we call a uh, bottom up type of question. And maybe Matt can help me out by finding our top down versus bottom up uh, lesson. Thank you, Matt. Um, but because of that, I, if we are gonna talk about answer choice strength, I would be really careful because sufficient assumption questions just tend to prefer stronger answers necessary assumption questions tend to prefer weaker answers, if all else is equal. Well, yeah, I, see, I think I'm still learning kind of like when to make that decision. Well, I'll give you a, I'll give you a shortcut, okay? okay? Don't do it until you really understand it. Okay. <laughs> because like, that's, yeah, and I mean, that happens a lot, right? Like we give you a big belt of tools and you start looking at all these tools and you just start like bashing stuff with those various tools. And it's like, okay, well, <laughs> we're learning, but um, be careful because you know you're, you, you might hurt yourself uh, applying these tools in the wrong context. I generally don't advise that people think about answer choice strength until you really get yourself down to like a 50-50. Um, if this were a must be true question, then yeah, you could be skeptical of something that had absolute answers because it's hard to prove absolute answers like strong answers are hard to prove so on a must be true ish type of question we would probably be skeptical of strong wording but even in that case the correct answer for a must be true absolutely can contain strong wording if the facts of the passage justify that strong wording so answer yeah. choice strength is never our first thing okay Content trumps, and the, the correct method here for a um, sufficient assumption question is definitely to predict the answer, and then you gotta go in looking for an answer that, that has the goods. Like, which one of these is gonna prove our case? Uh, Don Debbie has a hand up. Hey, how's it going? Hey. I just wanted to go back to D for a second for question 12. Sure. That with you. Yeah. Um, so what D is saying is, had they been consulted, they would have agreed anyway. So why would they even need it to be consulted? It's kind of like they didn't. No, I, you still haven't. Nope. You're not understanding what D says. D is conditional, right? D only applies if each of the commission's members would have agreed to its being released had they been consulted. That's a necessary condition for then allowing the chairperson to release the report. All right, it says, basically what D says is, don't release the report unless each of the commission's members would have agreed to its being released had they been consulted. Okay. Do we know whether these commissions members would have agreed to its being released had they been consulted?
I, I no. No, that's why this is not the right answer. See, I, I'm looking for something that proves this chairperson guilty. And the problem with E is that it still leaves open the possibility that maybe each of these members would have agreed had they been consulted. I don't know. I don't wanna leave the defense any opportunity to get this chairperson off the hook, right? I'm, I, want, I want this to be guilty. I wanna win on the paperwork. I don't want there to be a trial. If I put D into my brief, we're still gonna to have to have a trial because I don't know whether these people would or would not. We're gonna to have to go get like, okay, now we're gonna go have to get a deposition for each one of these commissions members. Would you or would you not have agreed had you been consulted? And if they all say, yeah, sure, no problem, I would have agreed. Well, then we get this chairperson off the hook. And I don't, I don't wanna let them off the hook. I want them to be just guilty. Does that get you there? Um, I think I just need to redo this question. Um, Absolutely. Like I said, I think it's a pretty hard question number 12. I think that you should read the written explanation that's already in the demon. I think you should use the ask button if you're not 100% sure. This is a really good like teaching slash learning question and I absolutely would not move on to something else until I had made sure that I was really confident in, in understanding this one. A um, couple takeaways. Always predict the answer on a sufficient assumption question. Generally speaking, on the LSAT, largely, don't pick answers that you don't understand. And I think a lot of you are like, I don't know if it's imposter syndrome or if it's like someone convinced you that the LSAT is supposed to be hard and you're not supposed to understand it or whatever, but lots of times people end up going like, well, uh, I thought the answer was probably A, but then I didn't really understand D, and then I thought A was like too simple, so I, you know, I, I thought it was a trap, so I picked this other answer that I didn't actually even understand. And we have to like arrive at this place where we just simply do not pick answers we don't understand. Uh, this, like, if you're ever going to be successful on this test, it's going to make sense to you. The right answers make sense. The wrong answers don't make sense. In fact, it's a very, it's a very frequent reason why a wrong answer is wrong is that it just, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. When we finally do make sense of D, we realize, oh, there's still room for this person to get off the hook. And I don't want to leave them room to get off the hook. A leaves them no room to get off the hook. That's why the answer here turns out to be A. <laughs> Jeanette. Jeanette points out that people call it the hardest test ever and get wine after the test and then take a vacation. Um, it, people do do that. I think that you're thinking about it wrong. Uh, I, would, I would invite you to consider whether your grandparents or your great grandparents would have considered this a major drama in your life, okay? My folks were literally agricultural laborers, okay? When I get up in the morning, like I did today, and I think like, damn, I'm getting up kind of early because I have to record a podcast, then I have to teach a class, then I have to teach another class, then I have to teach another class after that, and I got all these emails, and I've got so much going on, and I think about all that, and then I think about my grandpa Herb, who used to literally walk like five miles to work to go make 15 cents an hour or whatever, busting his ass every day. That's hard work. That deserves wine. That deserves a vacation. The LSAT, really? <laughs> I know people think that it's this huge drama, but we're all so fortunate to be here. It's like you're, the, you're one of the most lucky people to ever exist on the planet you know, just by virtue of having the luxury of thinking that you're going to study for the LSAT and go to law school, you've already won at life compared to almost every other person who's currently on the planet, and definitely compared to everybody who ever lived a hundred years ago. I mean, so <laughs> I think, I don't know, a little bit of perspective, right? This is a game. I, it's kind of fun when you get good at it, 
it's not nearly as hard as the shit you're going to do in law school. <laughs> Matt will endorse that idea. And it's just like, we can all just kind of get over our own little personal drama by thinking about what other people in the world go through all the time. I'm not saying that it doesn't require hard work. It does require hard work. But I promise you that the people who eventually are successful on this test consider it to make sense and basically be fun. That's where we're going. If you're with me, that's where we're going. <laughs> we're going to make this easy and fun. Um, ultimately, if you don't make the LSAT easy and fun, I think you're in for a world of hurt when you get to law school and the bar exam and legal practice. I think all that stuff is going to be way, way harder than this. So let's decide now. <laughs> we're gonna you know, consider ourselves lucky to be here and we're gonna work our asses off, sure, but we can have a good time while we do it. We can have a laugh. And I really wanna, I really wanna teach you that, that these, these questions make perfect sense. Ultimately, they make perfect sense. There's one right answer, there's four wrong answers. And when you understand it, it clicks and it makes perfect sense. And that's what we're gonna do. Question after question after question, one at a time. With me, sorry for the sermon. Uh, sometimes it just kind of happens. All right, um, <clears throat> I would like to uh, skip the two uh, remaining logical reasoning questions that are on the syllabus. Of course, you guys can just go ahead and do these questions. We've got the best in the world written explanations. We've got video explanations that are awesome. We've got the ask button. We've got an entire team of LSAT tutors that are there to help you if you hit the ask button. You'll be shocked at how fast uh, Abigail and company get back to you with help um, when you need it. Um, so there's lots of stuff that uh, you can do on your own to sort out those other two logical reasoning questions.